And our next speaker is Eva Silverstein, who will tell us about something from nothing. So I want to thank the organizers also for such a wonderful conference. I'm going to discuss some work done recently with Ofer Aharoni, Michal Faubinger, and Gary Horowitz. So like everybody else, I have a long story to tell in a brief time, so I'm going to start with a summary. Um, this talk will be about an interesting class of time-dependent backgrounds, which are known as bubbles of nothing. I'll explain that if that's not familiar. Uh, which are smooth, weakly coupled solutions in which we can reliably access certain interesting phenomena in time dependence, in particular issues of cosmological horizons and particle production. These spaces are very interesting, even at the level of general relativity, because they exhibit features of de Sitter space, Rindler space, and moving mirror systems, while being simple and smooth solutions of general relativity and string theory. As we go, we'll uncover some novel, or at least newly realized, features of the dynamics of these uh, bubbles, these space times. Um, so these last two points will become clear or as we go. Let me start with the simplest version of this space time, which has been studied quite a bit following Witten's work on a non perturbative, a dramatic non perturbative contribution to the instability of Schirk Schwartz compactifications. The idea is to begin with a d dimensional Schwarzschild solution, whose metric I've recorded here, and make the following two wick rotations of coordinates. So take the time of the black hole and make it i times some new spatial variable chi, which will become an angular variable. And at the same time, take the angular variable theta and turn it into a new temporal variable tau. The result of this is the metric I've written down here, which has the feature that the spherical slices of the Schwarzschild solution become de Sitter slices of the new time-dependent metric. And this metric is completely smooth you see that it doesn't make any sense if r goes below r naught. And indeed, as shown by these authors and previous authors who looked at the Euclidean solution, if you expand around r equals r naught and look at the r chi space, it becomes just a simple plane described in polar coordinates, r being the radial coordinate and chi being an angular coordinate, provided that chi has the periodicity that I've written here. And in order to avoid any singularities associated with fermions in the space, one needs to take fermions, any fermions that are present, to have anti-periodic boundary conditions. So as the black hole was, this is a solution of Einstein's equations. And here, in fact, there's no singularity anywhere. It's a smooth, constant dilaton solution. At a fixed time, the geometry can be depicted as I've drawn here, where, as I said, chi is an angular variable. So asymptotically, as you go to large r, the r chi plane just becomes a cylinder with the direction around the cylinder parameterized by chi and schirk schwartz boundary conditions. And as I said, as you go in toward <coughs> r equals r naught, it smooths out into a, into a smooth cigar end. And you have such an endpoint for every value of the angular coordinates omega. So this is the picture at a fixed time. The evolution is what I've depicted here in terms of this generalized Penrose diagram. The de Sitter evolution of the bubble is depicted in the middle of the diagram and has the effect, just as in de Sitter space, that massive particles propagating on this geometry accelerate away from each other and end up outside each other's future light cones. This leads to cosmological observer-dependent horizons. Here, these horizons have infinite area, so we are able to separate the issue of cosmological horizons per se from the additional difficulty that arises in de Sitter space of having cosmological horizons of finite area, and therefore finite entropy. So 
these authors uh, studied this space by chopping it in half and gluing it to a Euclidean solution in order to describe an instanton decay process. But here, our point of view will be to consider the fully Lorentzian solution as an interesting time-dependent background in its own right. So these are smooth solutions to general relativity, and therefore they solve string theory to the leading order in alpha prime. And by taking the parameter r naught, just determining the curvature scale of this geometry to be large, we can make that a very good approximation. Furthermore, if we think about alpha prime corrections, since the solution is isolated at fixed boundary conditions, it is clear that we can find a new solution to the equations of motion order by order in alpha prime by taking the original fixed point, adding whatever small tadpoles arise order by order in alpha prime, and finding a new RG fixed point nearby. In the Lorentzian case, in the four dimensions, we've explicitly studied the small fluctuations, and one finds nothing localized near the bubble, no massless or tachyonic modes. And I believe these results have been generalized recently to higher dimensions by Gibbons and Hartnell. So in working directly in Lorentzian space also, one sees that this should be a good solution order by order in alpha prime. However, quantum mechanically, this bubble, which I'll refer to as the Schwarzschild case, or the Schwarzschild bubble, is unstable because of the schirk schwartz circle at radial infinity. Remember that, this, we, that at infinity we have this anti-periodic boundary conditions for fermions. And as Rome calculated explicitly many years ago, um, this is unstable already at the one loop order, as you would generically expect. There is a potential for the radius which is generated, which drives it toward smaller values, toward a regime where winding mode tachyons appear. And um, so the, the bubble solution is unstable perturbatively. In addition, there could be uh, non-perturbative decays coming from instanton effects arising from nucleation of further bubbles. But this is really the leading instability in the system, which already rules it out as a quantum, as a reliable space quantum mechanically. However, there is a simple generalization which solves this problem, which comes by considering, instead of Schwarzschild black holes, rotating black holes. And again, these have been studied in the context of instanton decays by many people, starting with Dauker et al. What I've done here is write down for you the four-dimensional uh, Kerr metric already doubly analytically continued in an analogous way to the way I did the Schwarzschild case for you explicitly. So the things to notice about this are that again, the time of the black hole solution became this angular variable chi, uh, the spatial variable chi, which <coughs> mixes with uh, one of the angular variables phi. And this is where the original angular momentum of the black hole came from. But here, it's just a mixing between two spatial coordinates. The simplification that arises in this case comes when you think carefully about the identifications that are applied by uh, requiring the space-time to be smooth, analogous to the periodicity of chi we had in the first case. Here, the identifications require that at the same time we, we shift chi, we also rotate in the angular direction phi. This is the direction in which the black hole had, had rotation before we continued. So <clears throat> the picture of the space-time in this case is, at a fixed time is what I've drawn here. There is a bubble which excises the region near the origin of a complex plane that we've rotated at the same time that we've shifted in a transverse direction chi. This will lead to simplification at the quantum level because of the fact that the identifications are by larger and larger amounts as you go to infinity. So the schirk schwartz circle, if you like, is getting larger and larger, and supersymmetry is locally restored as we go out to infinity if we embed this in the superstring, which is our main, 
which is what we'll do. So that's the fixed time description of this, of this Kerr case. The evolution of the bubble can be obtained by looking <coughs> near the bubble in that metric I wrote down. And here, something very different happens relative to the Schwarzschild case. Clearly, at fixed time for small angular momentum parameter beta, we recover the results we had for the first case. And you can see that clearly from this metric. It evolves like the sitter space. However, uh, for any non-zero beta for large enough tau, the behavior turns out to be quite different. The metric reduces to what I've written here and shows that the bubble has simply stopped expanding at all. So in pictures, this was the fixed time. Uh, the time evolution is depicted in these drawings. In real space, it's like this. The bubble sits there and contracts and then expands um, and stops. And the Penrose diagram is what I've drawn here. Since the bubble stops accelerating, uh, it does not destabilize the space. It doesn't cut into null infinity the way that the Schwarzschild bubble does. And time-like observers can simply avoid the bubble. By tuning beta, this parameter that came from the angular momentum of the Kerr solution, to very small values, we can make the de Sitter evolution period, the, what I'll call the de Sitter epoch, as long as we want. But ultimately, the solution turns over into what I'll refer to as the Milne e epoch, where the bubble stops accelerating and the space around the bubble expands, as you can see from that metric that I wrote, linearly in proper time rather than accelerating. So the pattern so far is that the bubbles continue to accelerate into regions in which the circle stays at finite size, so supersymmetry is broken asymptotically, but not into regions where supersymmetry is locally restored asymptotically. And indeed, this pattern continues in higher dimensions. If we take the Myers-Perry solutions for rotating black holes and rotate all of the possible planes uh, generically, then we get a bubble which stops accelerating in all directions. And we can sort of have our cake and eat it too by uh, rotating some planes but not all of the planes, localizing quantum instabilities into some swath of space while allowing the bubble to accelerate eternally in those directions. So I've already said this. But we should talk about the stability of the Kerr case, because that was the main reason to go, go to it. So as I've explained, quantum mechanically, this case is, is uh, on much better ground. Um, there is a one-loop stress energy generated, as in the calculation of Rome for Schwarz. But here, the Schwarz circle gets larger and larger as we go out to infinity. Supersymmetry is restored, and this effect dies off rapidly, like 1 over r to the 10th as we go out to infinity. So this stress energy, which is generated quantum mechanically, can be absorbed radial, in radial variations of the dilaton and metric, like any other source of localized stress energy. Having said that, I should emphasize that we have not been able to check the classical stability of these uh, bubbles completely. This is related to the fact that it's been, proved, it's been so far prohibitively difficult to establish that Kerr black holes in higher dimensions are stable under small perturbations of the metric, these equations are very difficult to separate. And there's a rich uh, set of solutions one can find in higher dimensions with rotations, but uh, it's expected that Kerr black holes, particularly the ones with small angular momentum, um, and our bubbles, which are closely related, uh, 
We expect them to be stable, but we have not proved this. So that's the situation at the, at the perturbative level. Uh, Non-perturbatively, there can be um, additional bubbles in situations where we don't rotate all the planes and keep supersymmetry uh, broken in some direction. So let me put back this, this slide. In this case, there can be extra bubbles nucleated. But in this case, there's a preferred origin, and the bubble we started with is already taking up that, that um, position. So there can't be any similar bubbles um, introduced quantum mechanically. So this case seems like a very nice um, background to study. So let's proceed and study some interesting physics arising from it. One piece of very interesting and very basic physics that arises immediately in considering generic time dependence is that of particle creation. So as I was saying at the beginning, these bubble solutions have a lot in common with, say, moving mirrors or Rindler space. And as such, they provide a kind of textbook example in which to study particle production. But in some sense, they're, they're nicer in that they're smooth solutions. They don't require any external forces to accelerate the observer or the mirror or whatever. They don't have any singularities as black holes and FRW do, which we hope to understand someday, but don't yet. And unlike in quantum field theory, we couldn't consider non-solutions of the equations of motion. So this is a nice case to do, which we'll generalize to string theory in a simple way. I'm going to start, though, by doing a calculation of particle production in quantum field theory on this space. And I'm going to do it in the four-dimensional Kerr case, whose, met whose metric I wrote earlier. And the strategy will be to actually follow Hawking's original strategy in the black hole case, namely work with, consider wavelength uh, frequencies, which are much bigger than the 1 over r naught scale of our geometry. Consider a mode, which is pure positive frequency on scry plus, and using a geometric optics approximation, uh, which says that the phase remains approximately constant as we uh, propagate through the geometry, we can trace this back to a mode on scry minus by studying nearby geodesics and rewrite this constant phase in terms of the light cone coordinate v on scry minus. We will find, as one expects generally, that this is not a pure positive frequency mode on scry minus. So I'll kind of flash through this calculation a bit quickly. Um, hoping that the strategy at least is clear. So to study these nearby geodesics, we need to find the geodesics and let's concentrate on S waves. So the condition for a null curve uh, in the S wave with no momentum along the chi direction is trivial. We, we can integrate it trivially and we get this expression for the geodesics relating r and tau along a geodesic in terms of some integration constant c, which labels which geodesic we're talking about. By <coughs> writing the light cone coordinates at null infinity in terms of r and tau and plugging in the geodesic relation between tau and r, we can find u and v, the light cone coordinates, in terms of the integration constant labeling the uh, geodesic. And then by solving for each of these as a function of, of c, we can solve for one in terms of the other and we get u being a non-trivial function of v. That function is, leads to a mode which is not pure positive frequency in terms of v. 
So to find the Bogolubov coefficients, we project onto Fourier modes of V and obtain um, these general formulas. The interesting coefficient is beta, describing the mixing between positive and negative frequencies, which determines the number of particles produced. We can use a stationary phase approximation to evaluate the integrals. And when we do that, we find the following results for the Bogolubov coefficients. Approximately, this is a stationary phase approximation. In doing that, there was a self-consistent approximation, assuming that the bulk of the particle production comes from the, the de-sitter phase of the geometry, and that is true. And in fact, our results agree with an exact analysis, with an asymptotic expansion of an exact analysis for the Schwarzschild bubble. In any case, um, this produces an interesting particle production effect in a smooth geometry, um, but without introducing any large back reaction, because you see the beta coefficient is quite small, we're at high frequencies and it goes exponentially to zero at high frequencies. Okay, so that was field theory. And of course, there are many other computations one could do in field theory, extending beyond the S waves and looking at um, particles localized near the bubble. Uh, but one of the most interesting questions that all this time dependent stuff raises is how do we discuss such simple phenomena as particle creation in perturbative string theory? It's interesting partly because particle creation produces multi-particle states, squeeze states, as I'll explain shortly, and string theory being a first quantized framework doesn't necessarily naturally incorporate that, even though it is a perturbative phenomenon. So uh, why do I say it produces squeeze states? Um, well, let's work in a Heisenberg representation. So we start, we have a state which, let's say, is the in vacuum, which means that it is killed by the annihilation operators of the field expanded in the natural basis in the past. And the state remains the same, but we evolve the operators. So in the future, there's a new set of creation and annihilation operators, and the annihilation operators no longer kill the state. They are related to the old operators by the Bogolubov transformation. And setting A on the vacuum to zero produces a state which, in terms of the oscillators appropriate to the future, is this simple squeezed state. So this raises the question, then, of how we describe squeeze states in perturbative string theory. And here I want to emphasize I mean space-time squeeze states, not squeeze states of oscillators, as we've heard in other talks, um, squeeze states of world sheet oscillators. Here it's space-time oscillators that we're talking about. So it's a bit confusing to figure out how to describe them. Of course, one approach would be to go straight to string field theory, and this has been explored in the past. Um, but there might be a way to finesse it, which is what I want to explain now. So let's first recall how we describe uh, coherent states, which are ordinary infinitesimal deformations at the background. At the world sheet level, we describe that by shifting the world sheet action by some integral of the corresponding vertex operator. And here, instead of a coherent state, we generate a squeeze state in a time-dependent background with particle production. So it suggests that the naive generalization here would be to deform the world sheet action by this bilocal deformation in world sheet vertex operators, both at positive frequency uh, by an amount proportional to the coefficient in that squeeze state, depending on the Bogolubov coefficients in this way. So this may look bizarre, but such a thing has been seen recently in another context, which is, of course, how we came to this. Uh, namely, in considering generic multitrace deformations of ADS-CFT, a very similar phenomenon occurs. There, um, as has been realized in, in recent works, um, if one considers ADS-CFT and deforms the field theory side by a multi-trace deformation, then at the supergravity level on ADS, this represents a deformation of boundary conditions 
on the time-like boundary of ADS. It's worth emphasizing that this boundary condition is non-local on the S5, which has a large proper size. Uh, but anyway, at the level of ADS, it is a simple um, deformation of the boundary conditions. And at the world sheet level, at least perturbatively in the deformation, and presumably also non-perturbatively given examples where this deformation can be made large, preserving conformal invariance, uh, the description involves such a bilocal deformation of the world sheet action. Now here, we're talking again about a deformation of a boundary condition. If we consider a matrix element involving a squeeze state, then relative to the usual vacuum, that represents a new boundary condition on the path integral, which again seems to be represented at the world sheet level by this bilocal deformation. So that is an interesting direction, I think, to pursue as a way of um, approaching the problem of particle production in string theory. What are we at, five? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, I have, let me just flash a couple more things. Uh, okay, um, all right, well, so here are some future directions along these lines. Um, one interesting thing to do would be to try and compactify transversely to the, to the bubbles to obtain gravity on the bubbles as opposed to 10 dimensional gravity. Um, it'd be nice to do more uh, on the particle creation, both in field theory and string theory. Gary explains some interesting new results about colliding uh, Schwarzschild bubbles. There's an interesting project in progress by these folks uh, doing the ADS case where the boundary field theory lives on de Sitter space and quantum field theory on de Sitter space without gravity has well-defined observables that may translate into, into an answer to the question of what those horizons mean in the bulk. Um, and there are other ways to get acceleration, like to really try and construct de Sitter space. Uh, well, I wanted to make some comments on the instanton case. Um, so these, these backgrounds have been studied as instantons, but it's worth emphasizing that perturbative instabilities, um, for example, in the Schwarzschild case, come first. And there are some perturbative methods of stabilizing those moduli, which actually remove uh, the smooth instanton solution. And in the case we just found, the Kerr case, the bubble, even if it nucleates quantum mechanically, we saw that in the generic case, it doesn't actually represent an instability. So I think this is an interesting point to keep in mind in thinking about these backgrounds as instantons. So let me, let me stop there. Okay, so questions? Kurt. I think you got short change. Surely that's not a full 30 minutes. <laughs> but, but my question is, <laughs> you, you, you had a, uh, a world sheet action with a non-local uh, deformation, and you spoke of its being conformally invariant. Uh, what, what would that mean? perturbatively, they just generate a new set of diagrams in which that contribution is brought down to the action, and the resulting world sheet path integral um, um, We have not understood this deformation non-perturbatively in its coefficient. Yeah, I guess I was trying to push you on the question of whether there was some abstract definition of what conformal invariance meant in a non-local theory. Good. Okay. My last question was answered by your last transparency, so let's thank the speaker again.